Electric Company, partners in the community. And by the members of Maryland Public Television. in part by a grant from the Farm Credit System, the nation's borrower-owned banks and associations that provide credit and related services to American agriculture with a new symbol of progress. Good morning and welcome to a new Farm Day. I'm Charlotte Nichols. And I'm Tom Armbruster. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today we'll hear how some Texas farmers are leaning towards a less traditional crop as a moneymaker. And we'll overlook some of the more dour aspects of contemporary agriculture and look in on a Mississippi success story. But first, here's the news. There's some concern in Washington this morning that high levels of grain forfeiture under the government's loan program will result in another massive grain glut. Iowa Republican Congressman Cooper Evans says a failure to remedy the situation could result in virtually all of next fall's carryover being owned by the Commodity Credit Corporation. Evans says USDA officials recognize the problem and are considering four possible options. One is to invite producers to bid on the number of bonus bushels required to redeem their loans at the original rate plus interest. Another is a pick plow-up authority, enabling the USDA to pay some farmers during the summer to destroy planted crops. A third allows the payment of all or some of deficiency payments with payment in kind certificates. The fourth option is to expand the export bonus program. The Agriculture Department this afternoon will release its latest crop estimates for this season and we'll have those numbers for you tomorrow. Private forecasters have also taken a stab at predicting what the report will show and here are those numbers. The corn crop is estimated at an average of 8.6 billion bushels, a bit higher than USDA's October forecast. Private crop forecasters peg the soybean crop at 2.1 billion bushels, and that's also higher than the most recent Agriculture Department projection. Texas has always been known for its beef and barbecue, but that's not the only Texas food that people are hearing about these days. A lot of planters in East Texas claim that blueberries may be the next big crop. Mike Nasur has more in this report. Right now, there are only a few hundred acres of blueberries in all of Texas, enough to supply only part of the potential market. But within a few years, that could change. Farmers from all over have heard that blueberries can be a big moneymaker. And at this conference on blueberries in Athens, Texas, the Texas Department of Agriculture made it clear that the farmers have an opportunity to get in on the start of a new industry in the state. Well, my first reaction was I was totally surprised that blueberries would grow in the south, never mind East Texas. And uh, I had been in the east some, and I knew how prize they were and uh, when I found out a little bit about the economics uh, I thought it just had enormous potential. We've already found out that once Texans start eating blueberries they like them. A lot of people you know you ask them uh, do you like blueberries? And they said no I don't. And then you ask them well have you ever tried any? And said no I haven't. And we said well try them and they like them and, and uh, the uh, response is really good. Uh, it's a matter of consumer education. And if we grow them, they can be sold. Uh, do you think prospects for the sales of fresh blueberries in Texas are good? Absolutely. The prospects are tremendous. The Texas Department of Agriculture, along with the state's colleges and private buyers, are encouraging the East Texas farmers to learn more about blueberries and consider them as a crop. Texas Department of Agriculture marketing surveys show hundreds of millions of dollars in blueberries could be sold each year in the state. It's the kind of new crop that can help put the profit back into agriculture. From Athens, I'm Mike Nassour reporting. Thanks, Mike. Grain and soybean prices were higher yesterday on the Chicago Board of Trade. Wheat was boosted by spillover support from corn and beans, as well as weather forecasts calling for lingering wet weather in the production belt. That could delay winter wheat planting. December corn up a half to 237 and three quarters. March was unchanged at 244 and a half. Beans slightly higher at the close. January up three quarters to 530 and a quarter. March gained one at 540 and a quarter. Soy meal was higher on spillover support. December up 40 to 147.80. January was up 30 to 147.50. Soy oil slightly lower on technical factors. December unchanged to 2067. January fell 2 to 2076. Wheat slightly higher on the weather-related news. December climbed two and a quarter to 329. March was up three to 334 and a quarter. 
Kansas City wheat also higher at the close. December up two to three twenty nine and a quarter. March advanced two to three thirty one and a quarter. Cotton lower at the close. December fell twenty two to sixty one twelve. March lost twenty seven to sixty two. Orange juice was again higher. January was up 20 to 114.50. March up 35 to 114.85. Feeder cattle higher on ideas that cash cattle price strength will continue. January feeders up 10 to 68.15. March up 5 to 68.12. Live cattle also higher on spillover support. December up 7 to 66.87. February gained 33 at 63.35. Live hogs were up. December up 23 to 47.05. February contracts climbed 35 to 46.55. And Pork Valley settled lower at the close on technical factors. February down 10 to 62.50. March dropped 5 to 62.67. Liquidation and foreclosure are a couple of buzz buzzwords, excuse me, synonymous with American agriculture in the 80s. But there are some success stories around the country, like the one recounted in this report by the Mississippi Extension Services, Artist Ford. Warner McBride, his wife Phyllis, and their three sons love their farming way of life. Love, however, is not enough to overcome today's high production costs and low cow prices. Warner inherited this cattle operation from his grandfather. It appeared, however, the family's farming tradition would end unless something was done to make the farm stop losing money. Phyllis McBride says they wouldn't be in business today if the farm had not changed. We had kept on at that rate. We couldn't have been farming, you know, and stayed on yeah. the farm. We'd have had to just shut it down completely. Even though he had the land, he couldn't have kept going that way. In 1981, the McBride sought the help of the Panola County Extension Office of the Mississippi Cooperative Extension Service and Mississippi State University. The turnaround on the McBride farm is not complete, but Warner and Phyllis say they are headed in the right direction. Since 1981, the 200-strong McBride cow herd has been cut by more than half, but the farm is grossing just as much, but with much less expense. Calf weaning weights on the farm have increased 17%. The herd's conception rate has increased from a state average 70% up to 89%. Panola County Assistant Agent Jimmy McLean has worked with the McBrides for two years. He gives them most of the credit for their progress. They correspond with each other and they're able to spend a lot of time together uh, on the farm here. And uh, Phyllis is very interested in it and she's helping with the records and, and gives Warner a lot of, a lot of encouragement. And uh, I think this is really the team approach that they've taken on this is really one of the reasons for their success. What turned the McBride farm around? At the time when the McBrides contacted their county extension office, they were working hard, but the operation was not getting ahead. The McBrides enrolled their herd in the Cattle Herd Analysis Management Program, better known as CHAMP. CHAMP is an extension service program that computer analyzes a producer's beef operation and recommends ways to improve efficiency. The extension service also formed a beef demonstration team to work with the McBrides. The team's eight members are specialists in animal science, herd health, economics, nutrition, and related fields. The demonstration team's first recommendation was culling the poor quality cows out of the McBride herd. At first, Phyllis and Warner were skeptical, but now they're producing the same amount of beef with half the cows. Each brood cow has her own individual record card where her production is recorded. If she doesn't measure up, she's sold. Well, we've learned a lot, just, you know, the practices they've given us to try. It's just amazing what you can learn. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you know what you're doing, you get out there and you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. When you got better records, you can, you can see what your cows are doing before. Before you used to know what your top end cow was and your bottom end cow, but you never knew what your middle cows were doing. A complete vaccination and herd health program was implemented with the help of Mississippi State University's College of Veterinarian Medicine. Brahma and Santa Gertrudis bulls were introduced to gain increased calf weaning weights through hybrid vigor. Warner's year-round calving program was replaced with a three-month synchronized breeding season. There were several side benefits to the new scheduling. Warner and Phyllis now get needed work accomplished and have more time to spend with their three boys. Before we had gotten involved with it, it seemed like we were just going constantly trying to fix fences and do this and that and the other, everything that needed to be done. And with the CHAMP program, it was more seasonal. Improvements in calf size and better quality have also paid off with better sales. In the past, Warner simply sold his calves at a sale barn, taking whatever price he could get. Now he attracts cattle company order buyers to his ranch, cutting out the middleman and receiving higher prices. Another byproduct of the McBride's involvement with the extension service is better record keeping. In the past, they kept only the records they needed to complete their income taxes. Now they borrow Warner's father's personal computer to run financial programs developed by the extension service and Mississippi State University. 
The computer allows them to keep more detailed records and lets them know their financial status and cash flow position. While all the improvements haven't resulted in greatly increased profits, Warner and Phyllis are making definite progress. Our cow herd is down half or even mm -hmm. three-fourths of what it was. But as far as the weaning weights on the calves, we can see that you can make as much with a heavier weaning weight. And, well, we've gotten out of debt as far as what he started out with. Mm -hmm. But until we can actually say that we're making a profit, we're going to have to build the herd back up. The replacement heifers coming into the herd promise to increase weaning rates even more. McLean believes the McBride's operation shows success can still be had with a no-frills operation. A good example of just uh, an ordinary operation is no fancy fences and there's no, uh, uh, nothing real fancy about it. Uh, I think he just started taking better care of, of some land here that's really suited for grass and, and for growing cattle on it, and uh, it's responded for him. Warner and Phyllis are more optimistic now than they were in 1981. Warner encourages farmers caught in similar situations to not be in a hurry and get too big too fast. Also, don't be afraid to ask for help. I think you need to be more patient. We try to get in too big of a hurry when we first got in the cattle business and doing that you can roll up a lot of debt, maybe more than you can handle, but if you take your time and like we got several different places we need to work on. We figure we can expand and work on our pastures at the same time. They'll both be ready at one time instead of going out and buying a bunch of cattle and then you don't have your pastures ready and then you don't have the money to prepare them like you need to. I'm Artis Ford reporting. Thank you, Artis, for that report. We have a somewhat abbreviated cash livestock market report this morning due to yesterday's Veterans Day holiday. Cash hog bids were higher and cash cattle at the terminals were steady to slightly higher. In Omaha, choice slaughter steers went for 63 to 65.75, 65 to 65.50 in Peoria, 64 to 65.50 in Sioux City, 62.50 to 65 in Sioux Falls, and 62 to 64 in St. Paul. Choice slaughter heifers in Omaha sold for 63 to 65, 61.50 to 64.50 in Peoria, 62.50 to 64.25 in Sioux City, 61 to 63.50 in Sioux Falls, and 60 to 63 in St. Paul. In the hog market, U.S. 1s and 2s in Omaha went for 44.50 to 45.50, 45 to 45.75 in Peoria, and 44.50 to 45 in St. Louis. And before we go this morning, we'd like to send out a couple of Farm Day hellos today to the American Bakers Association meeting, their meeting in Las Vegas, Nevada, and the second hello to the Peanut Butter and Nut Processors Association meeting out in Tucson, Arizona. We sounds, hope they have some good meetings. Yeah, sounds like they should get together, the peanut butter and the bakers. And, and the bakers, a, that's right. <laughs> nice, uh, Always anyway. an association for everything, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, what do you think about that grain glut? Do you think it should go towards an export bonus program or uh, some other type of... There has been so much attention on that export bonus program. You know, it amazes me, you know, whether they should give, uh, you know, the access to the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, other countries that don't really seem to care about it. I don't really know. We'll, we'll find out. Let us know what you think. We'd be interested in hearing from you. That's all for today's program. Thanks for being with us. I'm Charlotte Nichols. And I'm Tom Armbruster. Thanks for joining us, and have a good farm day. Farm Day is made possible in part by a grant from the Farm Credit System, the nation's borrower-owned banks and associations that provide credit and related services to American agriculture with a new symbol of progress. Farm Day is a production of Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. A bundle of years ago, an enterprising young man bought almost a million high silk hats from a bankrupt manufacturer and had them shipped to Africa. Africa? Yes. You see, he, he very cleverly convinced the natives that anybody who was anybody always wore high silk hats. And in no time, he sold every hat and made a huge profit from the transaction. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Yes, but don't laugh too loudly because the same thing happens here today. If Johnny Carson wore green hair on his show one night, the next day, everybody would have green hair. The fashion people in New York and Paris tell us what's in style, and like sheep, we follow their lead. It's planned obsolescence elevated to the clothes industry. 
it keeps the wheels turning. If somebody says, uh, wear, wear bow ties, pretty soon everybody and his uncle are wearing bow ties. <laughs> AM weather is made possible by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hilton Hotels, America's business address. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. The AOPA Air Safety Foundation. The National Business Aircraft Association. Phillips Petroleum Company. And Showalter Flying Service Orlando. weather. I'm Wayne Winston. And I'm Joan Von Ahn. Well, winter-like weather has invaded the country, most of the country, especially west of the Mississippi River. Now, rather strong, low-pressure system centered out west is still producing some snow over the Great Basin and the northern Rockies today. Monday evening, five inches of snow was picked up at Cedar City, Utah, with nine inches at Kearns and four inches at Salt Lake City. Up to 12 inches of snow has fallen in several other spots in Utah. Now, by yesterday morning, two to three feet of snow was picked up at Lake Tahoe with 25 inches at Blue Canyon, California, and then 10 inches at both Ely and Austin in Nevada. Well, in contrast, thunderstorms and rain fell in the lower elevations of Southern California, with some small hail being reported at Long Beach, El Toro, and Point Magoo. Well, thunderstorms also brought some heavy rains to Texas during the past few days. Six and three quarters of an inch at Reclaw, four and two thirds of an inch at Longview, then Hallettsville picked up seven and a half inches of rain in less than three hours, with four and a half inches being picked up at Conroe. Some of these thunderstorms also produced some tornadoes in the southeastern parts of Texas yesterday. Among them were Tavener, Bonus, and Wallace. However, no damage was reported. Well, the plains also had a taste of winter. Snow and freezing rain has been falling in parts of the northern plains and the upper Mississippi Valley, causing slick road conditions from central Nebraska into northern Wisconsin early this morning. Then some light rain and drizzle has been falling from the southern plains through the mid-Mississippi Valley and on into central New England, where it was mixed in with some light snow and freezing drizzle. Well, heavy fog blankets most of the eastern and southern part of the country this morning, especially in the southeast and Gulf. And finally, yesterday, we saw that was a day for record temperatures to be broken. Record lows were broken out in the western part of the country with record highs in the east. Among them was 18 degrees at Seattle, Washington, only 8 degrees at Sault Ste. Marie. Among the high temperature records were 76 degrees at Atlantic City, New Jersey, and 75 degrees at Baltimore, Maryland. Well, that wraps up Tuesday morning's national map, and Wayne on satellite should get a real good look at that storm system out west. Right, an important system it is. It's already produced a lot of snow the past couple of days, and certainly has all the potential of producing uh, some more heavy snow in the upcoming 24 to 48 hours. Now, we don't have our usual satellite motion this morning, but we do have a series of pictures taken at uh, various intervals through the past 24 hours, and we can see how the systems have been moving about. First look down in the eastern part of Texas, Louisiana. That's where those heavy thunderstorms developed, as you can see that by that bright area of white clouds that produced a lot of rain, even a tornado around the Houston area. That's been gradually spinning on northeastward, uh, taking the precipitation along with it. While out west, we have the steady progression of that uh, storm there. Inland, with its cold front, uh, the upper level low, we can see this with a, with a small area of clouds down, down over southern California. We get a close-up view of that with this picture taken at 1.30 this morning Pacific time. And we can see where the uh, main low center is in the northern part of Utah, and then the uh, cold front cuts southward uh, through the central part of Arizona this morning. Now, to the west, uh, in the cold air, there are some heavy showers. These are moving onshore into southern California, producing uh, rain at the very lowest elevations, but uh, dumping some heavy snow on some of the higher elevations in the mountains of southern California. Clear skies through northern California, sweeping back across Washington into western Montana. Now let's look at our very latest satellite picture taken at 5.30 this morning, Eastern Time. On the left-hand edge, we can see the advancing storm system uh, moving across the plateau this morning. Now, a lot of very light precipitation in the form of drizzle, light snow, some freezing drizzle reported through the central and northern plains in the upper Mississippi Valley. 
uh, not really well defined here. A lot of that low cloudiness we, we can't see this morning. As you move into the south and the east, rather extensive cloudiness right from the Gulf Coast northward through the Ohio Valley. A lot of precipitation, especially falling out of some of these clouds in the upper Ohio Valley, while high pressure over the Gulf of Mexico, keeping that area relatively clear. Well, let's look at the radar map, and as we just saw in the satellite picture out west, we can see some of those heavier showers that are moving onshore off the ocean areas into southern California, producing snow up in the mountainous areas. And then through Arizona, again, rain in the south, but as you move northward around Flagstaff, reporting heavy snow in the past hour or so, that snow scattered on northward up into Utah, the southwestern part of Wyoming. Now, in the Plains states, uh, some fairly heavy thunder showers reported in eastern Kansas and Oklahoma. See tops there are in excess of 40,000 feet. Then that rain is scattered along the front and extending north of the front in the lakes, rain drizzle. Uh, throughout that entire area extending into the southern parts of New England. Joan? Well, we've caught up on current weather conditions, so let's move ahead to the forecast segment of our program, and we'll start with a high temperature map for this afternoon. We find high temperatures will be below freezing from the interior northwest of the northern Rockies and into the upper Mississippi Valley, with 60s, 70s, and 80s covering most of the Atlantic seaboard and the southern part of the country. Now, overnight lows will dip below the freezing, below zero, that is, for extreme northern Montana and northwestern North Dakota. Teens in single digits from the upper Mississippi Valley into the Great Basin. Temperatures will generally be below freezing for most of the western part of the country. 60s and 70s will be found along most of the south and the Gulf of Mexico, as well as central and southern Florida. Now, on our first forecast map for this evening, we find some snow will be falling in parts of northern Maine. But rain and showers will extend from the rest of northern New England throughout the Midwest and on into the mid-Mississippi Valley, mixing in with some thunderstorms down into Texas. We'll find some snow falling in parts of the upper Mississippi Valley, as well as from the northern high plains and into the Great Basin, with rain from the central Rockies down into the southwest. Now, by tomorrow morning, we find snow continuing from the Great Basin into the Plain States, with rain and showers from the southern Rockies through the central plains into the upper Great Lakes and extending out to the New England and mid-Atlantic coast. Now finally on Thursday morning we find that low pressure center moving into the Midwest. We'll find rain and showers from northern New England through the Midwest, uh, mixing in with some thunderstorms for the lower Mississippi Valley and on into southern Texas. Find some freezing precipitation in parts of the eastern sections of the Plain States with some snow from the central high plains on into the central Rockies. And then we'll find a new funnel system beginning to approach the Pacific Northwest. Wayne? Next we have the best estimate of precipitation expected during the next 24 hours. Two important areas of precipitation, of course, the first out over the western states where there's going to be uh, plenty of snow. Now, this is liquid precipitation. You multiply that about uh, times 10 to get the actual snow amounts. You can see up to 10 inches of snow expected through the mountains of uh, Colorado, through Utah and southward into Arizona. Liquid precipitation during the next 24 hours, only in extreme southern Arizona and New Mexico. Also along that uh, front through the central part of the country into the lakes, heavy showers and thunder showers, locally one to two inches of rain, parts of Oklahoma and Missouri, as well as lower Michigan. Joan? Pilots, with all of the fog in the south and eastern part of the country and the snow out west, it's a good idea to be sure to pick up your detailed weather briefing before you take off. And you can get this at your local weather service office or flight service station. This morning, as I mentioned, there's a lot of fog in the east and the southeast. Marginal VFR and IFR conditions blanket roughly the whole eastern two-thirds of the country in a combination of fog and rain. Low conditions also in snow from the central Rockies out to the west coast with fog along the California coast and the coast of Southern California as well. Now looking at the icing this morning, we find two areas, one in the northeast from the freezing level to 20,000 feet, the other from the central Rockies out to the west coast between the freezing level and 16,000 feet. A look at the turbulence, we find jet stream turbulence between 20 and 40,000 feet in the northwest, moderate below 25,000 feet for the Rockies. Thunderstorms could reduce some turbulence up to 25,000 feet from the Midwest down to the lower Mississippi Valley, low level turbulence up to 8,000 feet for the eastern lakes. By this evening, once again, low conditions from New England through the Midwest out into the Great Basin, low conditions as well down to the lower Mississippi Valley. Look at the turbulence for Tuesday evening and we find moderate below 40,000 feet in the southwest, up to 25,000 feet from the central high plains down into the southern Rockies. Low level turbulence once again up to 8,000 feet from the eastern lakes into New England. It's time for winds aloft. Wayne has them starting at 2,000 feet above ground level. 
At the lowest level, generally a, a high pressure circulation extends all the way from the northeastern part of the country right down to the Gulf Coast with a second high circulation with those cold temperatures over the northern high plains. However, uh, at 2,000 feet above ground level, the wind speeds are light. They are less than 25 knots from coast to coast. However, when we move up to 10,000 feet, of course, we have that deep storm center over the southwestern part of the country and around that along the west coast and then to the Rio Grande Valley on northward through the lakes in New England. Here, strong winds speeds at this altitude between 25 and 50 knots. At 18,000 feet, much the same pattern with the strong winds circulating around the low out west and over the lakes in the two shaded areas, those speeds are between 50 and 100 knots. Finally, at 34,000 feet, strongest winds over New Mexico and Arizona in excess of 100 knots. You can see how the jet stream circulates around that low out over the uh, southwest, diagonally across the country. Now it's time for Weather Watch. Here again is Joan. We'll start Weather Watch this Tuesday morning in the northeast, where small craft advisories are up along the Atlantic coast from the Merrimack River in Massachusetts to Manasquan, New Jersey, including the Long Island Sound, New York and Boston harbors, and buzzards in Narragansett Bay. Winds are east to northeast from 15 to 30 knots. Moving southward, travelers' advisories are up in northeast Florida for fog until mid-morning. Fog is also caught prompting travelers' advisories this morning for east-central Louisiana and parts of west Texas. Now, along the Texas Gulf Coast, small craft advisories are up from Port O'Connor to Brownsville. Winds are southeast from 15 to 25 knots. Then lake wind advisories are in effect for the Texas Panhandle, parts of south Texas, and southwestern New Mexico today. Moving northward to the upper Mississippi Valley, we find travelers' advisories are in effect for a combination of snow and freezing rain in northern Wisconsin and parts of central Minnesota. Travelers' advisories for slippery roads and freezing drizzle are up in north central and northeast Iowa and in central Nebraska and northeast Colorado today. Now, winter storm warnings are in effect in Colorado for the southwest mountains today and tonight, and for tonight only in the remainder of the mountains. Winter storm warnings are also up in Utah in the South Central Mountains today and in Arizona in the northern two-thirds of the state for both today and tonight. Winter storm warnings are also up in southwestern Wyoming and extreme southern Nevada above 5,000 feet. Winter storm watches are up in parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Utah today and tonight. Be sure to tune in to NOAA Weather Radio for complete details. Travelers' advisories for snow are up today in parts of Wyoming and in Utah, with travelers' advisories for winds in the extreme southwestern parts of Utah. Snow is also prompting travelers' advisories today for most of Nevada and in California for the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Now, along the west coast, small craft advisories are flying along the entire Oregon coast for north-northeast winds from 10 to 20 knots. Small craft advisories are also up along California's coast from Point St. George to Point Arena for hazardous seas and from Point Arena to Point Conception for north-northwest winds from 15 to 25 knots. Finally, small craft advisories are up for California's outer coastal waters from Point Conception to San Clemente Island for west to northwest winds from 15 to 25 knots. That's Weather Watch and our program for today. Have a nice day and then join us again right here on Wednesday morning. Stay tuned now for a look at the local weather forecast for Maryland. AM weather is made possible by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hilton Hotels, America's business address. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. The AOPA Air Safety Foundation. The National Business Aircraft Association. Phillips Petroleum Company. And Showalter Flying Service Orlando. Around the state, fog is being reported in many areas, along with some areas of drizzle. Early morning temperatures mostly in the 50s with light easterly winds. Now in today's forecast, it will be mostly cloudy. There is a 40% chance of some light rain or drizzle, mostly during the morning hours. High temperatures today, generally in the 60s with easterly winds. Then for tonight, partly cloudy. Again, we have a 40% chance of a few showers, mostly during the evening hours, with low readings in the upper 40s to the mid 50s. On Wednesday, a sunny and unusually warm day for this time of the year with high temperatures in the upper 60s to the mid-70s. On the bay, winds will be out of the east between 10 and 20 knots today with waves as high as 2 feet. Visibility good, occasionally fair in the drizzle. The next high tide at Fort McHenry will be at 648 this evening.
Have a good day. We'll see you again on Wednesday morning. Programming is made possible in part by Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, partners in the community, and by the members of Maryland Public Television. System, the nation's borrower-owned banks and associations that provide credit and related services to American agriculture with a new symbol of progress. Good morning and welcome to a new farm day. I'm Charlotte Nichols. Tom Armbruster is on assignment this morning. Today we'll hear how some Texas farmers are being helped after losing their jobs. And we'll hear what one of our commodity experts thinks about the latest government crop report. But first, here's this morning's news. Senate action on the 1985 Farm Bill has been postponed once again. Senate Majority Leader Robert Dole yesterday announced that farm policy debate won't continue until Monday. Dole says the overwhelming importance of budget and deficit reduction issues must take priority over the Farm Bill. Republican members say the delay cannot be helped, but Democratic Party senators are accusing Dole of stalling so he can get support for his one-year price freeze amendment. As I mentioned yesterday, the National Association of Farm Broadcasters is meeting this week in Kansas City, Missouri. In one of the sessions, Senator Rudy Boschwitz addressed the association from Washington in a teleconference. Our Tom Armbruster has more from Kansas City. Senator Boschwitz was asked why Congress has failed to approve a farm bill. The senator responded by saying there is no good excuse for the delay, and he says he knows Congress is penalizing farmers by not acting. Boschwitz says it would be a miracle for a bill to be produced by Thanksgiving. The senator lays some of the blame with the USDA, saying they have shown very little leadership. Also during the teleconference, Boschwitz announced that he is introducing a new credit bill that would buy down interest rates and excuse up to 30% of the principal on some loans. So far, the bill has eight co-sponsors, including some Democrats. But for now, the major hurdle is passing a farm bill, and that hurdle is proving to be a difficult one. For Farm Day, I'm Tom Armbruster in Kansas City. Thanks, Tom. As long as there have been farms, there's been liquidation, foreclosure, and the inevitable displaced farmer. But these days, the problem is more widespread and is gaining much more attention than in the past. Mike Nasur reports on the efforts of Texas officials to help displaced farmers make a tough transition. What does a farmer do when he's lost the farm? In Texas alone, a hundred farmers or ranchers are forced out of business each week. This is because times are tough in agriculture. Because of this, the Texas Department of Agriculture is helping 34 local job training agencies to start displaced farmer programs to provide career counseling, job training, and placement services. Displaced uh, farmer is, is a, a, a sort of benign bureaucratic uh, euphemism uh, that, that hides a lot of pain. Uh, these people are, are not just displaced, uh, their lives are, are being ripped apart. Uh, families and entire communities, the entire uh, economic and social fabric uh, of the rural sections of our state uh, is being uh, torn apart uh, by this uh, farm depression. One of the most important parts of any counseling program is to restore the farmer's sense of self-worth to encourage them to go on and reshape their lives. There was a fellow walked into my office one day and he put a rope down on the desk and he said, here, 
help me because I just came from my farm with this rope. Three months later, the fellow started his own business. He was on the verge of suicide on the bridge that crosses the Mississippi River. And he said, I was standing there on that bridge and I happened to glance over and I saw the sign that said dislocated worker program. He had been a farmer. He was afraid to tell anybody he was losing, but he was losing ground very fast. These are the people we needed to help. Over a million dollars in federal funds could be used by local governments to help the former ranchers and farmers find new jobs and put their lives back together. There will also be a new farm crisis hotline set up by the Texas Department of Agriculture in Austin, which can inform those in trouble just where they can get the services they need. We're already seeing the costs of the farm crisis in rising unemployment and disrupted lives. The counseling, training, and job placement services being organized by the Texas Department of Agriculture will help those being forced off their land by government policies they can't control. From Austin, I'm Mike Nassour reporting. Thank you, Mike, for that report. Well, corn was higher yesterday and wheat and soybeans were lower yesterday on the Chicago Board of Trade. Beans remained pressured by trader anticipation of lower bean loan rates next year and corn was up on reports of new export business and wheat was lower on profit taking. Here's how it all broke down. December corn up three quarters to 240, March up a quarter to 245. Soybeans were lower January off four and three quarters to 520 and a half, March off four and three quarters to 530 and three quarters. Soy meal sharply lower, December down 290 to 142.70, January meal off 270 to 142.80. Soy oil was higher, December up 10 to 20.67, January up 9 to 20.79. Wheat fell slightly, December down 3 quarters to 3.38 and a quarter, March wheat off 2 to 3.38. Kansas City wheat fell, December down 3 quarters to 3.32 and 3 quarters, March KC wheat off 1 to 3.33 and a half. Cotton was lower on technical factors, December off 63 to 6079, March down 32 to 6175. Orange juice was also down, January fell 70 to 112.30 and March dropped 50 to 112.95. Feeder cattle was mixed, January off 52 to 66.65, March up 20 to 66.85. Live cattle was also mixed at the close, December up 2 to 65.47 and February down 33 to 61.32. Live hogs were higher, December up 48 to 45.75, February up 28 to 44.60. And pork bellies were also up, February up 40 to 59.05, March settled at 59.30, up 23. This past Tuesday's Agriculture Department crop report contained some figures that many commodity traders and analysts are calling bearish. I talked recently with analyst Patrick Buva about the report's implications to the market and what it could mean in the long term. Good morning, Patrick. Let's talk a little bit today about the USDA's latest crop report that just came out Tuesday. What record production for corn. Uh, tell me about that. How did that affect the market? Well, you know, Charlotte, we've, we've talked about it before here, and, and the market has been anticipating a large crop, and there's an old cliche that goes that um, a large crop tends to get larger, and this year it's certainly shown that. Um, back in the beginning of August, we knew that we were going to have a record large crop, or very close to a record large crop, um, regardless of what the numbers are, um, there's a burdensome supply on the market right now. And whether Tuesday we saw 8.7 billion bushels, um, earlier in the year we were talking 8.2 and 8.3 billion, and in fact it appears as though um, when we were getting the initial estimates of the crop, that's when the lows of the market were made. So are we looking at what kind of prices in the short term now? Well, I don't think you're going to see, I, I think it's safe to say now, Charlotte, that the the, uh, the lows for current crop prices are pretty well in. Um, a lot of people are saying that the trend has reversed. Um, I think you can almost go that far, and I can probably agree with that, that the trend has reversed to, it's certainly not down anymore, and, if, and, it, and it's, it's, it's sideways and, and more than likely higher right now. Um, it will be difficult to sustain a rally in the corn prices right now because of the very burdensome supply and the enormous carryover. Let's talk about them. that carryover. What are they projecting? It, obviously, it must be a lot more than last year. Indeed, it's, it's, it's well over twice last year. It's over 3 billion bushels of corn, which will be left over at the end of this marketing season. Um, they're preliminary projections, obviously, but even if they're, <clears throat> even if they're close to correct, that's a, that's a very burdensome supply. Um, and again, I think it, it remains to be seen how the export season goes. Um, it's starting off real well in wheat. Um, 
relatively speaking, it's well for wheat. Uh, corn is certainly lagging, but there does seem to be some interest from our, from our uh, foreign trade partners. As we wrap up here, let's talk a little bit about your advice to those people out there today thinking about getting into the market. What would you tell them? Well, I think, Charlotte, you can tell by the market that sidelines approach is, is, is probably the most popular right now, and I, I advocate being on the sidelines right now. I don't think, um, certainly at these prices, you don't want to be getting too aggressive in the buy side of the market. And I think with the, uh, the final stages of harvest being so much in jeopardy right now, I don't think you want to be a, an aggressive seller either. So my tendency is to buy breaks in the market. Um, I don't think we're going to be needing to sell the markets um, for quite some time yet. So I would say my, my, my clear advice right now is be on the sidelines, look to buy breaks. And kind of take a chance and watch and see for a little bit. Okay, Stay next clear. time let's talk about livestock uh, markets and how we're seeing prices uh, going in that area. Certainly. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Sean. And we'll have that report for you on Monday. Here's how cash livestock prices fared yesterday. Cash hog bids were mixed and receipts were above expectations. Cash cattle was lightly tested at the terminals. Choice slaughter steers in Sioux Falls went for 62.50 to 65 and 61.50 to 63.50 in St. Paul. Texas Panhandle feedlot steer prices were not established. Choice slaughter heifers in Sioux Falls went for 60.50 to 63.25 and 60 to 63 in St. Paul. Panhandle heifer prices were not established. Choice three steer carcasses brought 101. The cattle slaughter estimate for Thursday, 136,000. It was 5.4% lower a week ago and 3.5% higher a year ago. In Iowa, shorn lambs sold for 64 to 66 and wool lambs brought 61 to 64. U.S. 1s and 2s in Omaha sold for 43.25 to 44, 43 to 43.75 in Peoria and 43.50 to 43.75 in St. Louis. In cutout trade, loins sold for 92, hams for 82 and bellies for 49. The hog slaughter count, 327,000. It was 1.5% lower a week ago and 6.3% higher a year ago. It's that time again for a look into the Farm Day mailbag, and this week many of the letters we received dealt with our most recent at-issue question on interest rates. You'll remember the question, should the administration freeze interest rates for agricultural borrowers? Here's some of your responses. Donna Mercier of Duluth, Minnesota writes that I think a freeze would be beneficial to the borrower, but of course that will never happen, but I would like to see interest rates stay at a reasonable level. And Adrian Hendrickson, a banking official in Chaseburg, Wisconsin writes, with nearly 45% of our loans to farmers, I feel it would be a major mistake to freeze interest rates on loans. If interest rates are frozen, there must be a corresponding freeze on the cost of our deposits. And Mr. Hendrickson adds that our depositors demand return of their principal and a fair return of interest while the bank remains a safe and sound institution. Pearl Dexter of Amelia, Nebraska writes, Yes, interest rates should have been frozen several years ago when they first began to get out of hand. Loans would have been difficult to get, but people would not have expanded so far that they may lose their land. She adds that if interest rates were frozen at from 7 to 10 percent, many investors would have invested in industry, creating more jobs. And finally, from Wes Buller of Brookshire, Texas, this response, farmers must reject interest rate lowering for them only. Learning how to adjust to economic reality and spend only what can be felt in the pocket might help. Of course, I'd like to thank everybody who sent letters in on the subject of interest rates. And now I want to invite you to comment on our new at issue topic. It's been a while since we asked you to rate Congress, but we think now is a good time because of the Farm Bill and the deficit issue. Our question now is, how do you rate Congress during this Farm Bill year? Please drop us a line and let us know what you think. You can send your letters to Farm Day, Maryland Public Television, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Again, that's Farm Day, Maryland Public Television, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. And of course, thanks for taking the time to write. We really do appreciate your letters. And don't forget, if we read your letter on the air, we'll send you one of these Farm Day caps that maybe you can add to your con collection. But that's all for this morning's program. Thanks for joining me. I'm Charlotte Nichols. Tom Arn Brewster will be back on Monday. For all of us here, have a good Farm Day and a great weekend. Farm Day is made possible in part by a grant from the Farm Credit System the nation's borrower-owned banks and associations that provide credit and related services to American agriculture with a new symbol of progress. Farm Day is 
a production of Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Opportunity knocks, according to the old saying. Maybe so, but you have to recognize it and then do something with it. Chicago newspaper editor Arthur Brisbane in 1913 fired his movie critic because he felt motion pictures were a passing fancy. French General Marshal Foch in 1911 called airplanes an interesting toy with absolutely no military value. Another man about the same time begged his friends and his neighbors to invest in a new industry, but they considered him a nuisance, at best a dreamer. His name was John D. Rockefeller. How do you recognize a good thing when it comes to your door? Well, you can't always. You just keep trying and hoping, maybe praying. You keep your eyes and ears open, and you do more seeking than waiting. When opportunity knocks, remember, it doesn't open that door. You have to be smart enough to do that yourself. AM Weather is made possible by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hilton Hotels, America's business address. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. The AOPA Air Safety Foundation. The National Business Aircraft Association. Phillips Petroleum Company. The United States Aircraft Insurance Group. The Gorman Rupp Company. Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And Combs Gate. Welcome to AM Weather. I'm Carl White. And I'm Joan Von Ahn. Well, that winter storm is still going strong in the central plains, beginning to move towards the upper Mississippi Valley. As we go over to the national map, we see another storm approaching the Pacific Northwest this morning. Already some rain is falling in the coastal sections of Washington and Oregon with some snow in the higher elevations. Well, yesterday afternoon, some heavy snow fell over the Colorado Rockies and the high plains. More than one foot of snow blanketed the Pueblo, Wetmore, Beulah, and Rye areas, with more than nine inches of the snow being picked up in just six hours at Pueblo. Well, this morning we find snow falling from Idaho into Nebraska, where it becomes mixed with some freezing rain and sleet. Needless to say, travel throughout this part of the country is extremely hazardous early this morning. Well, with the snow, we find some unseasonably cold temperatures settling into the west and the north. Yesterday, numerous record lows were set. It was five below zero at Flagstaff, Arizona, three below zero at Winnemucca, Nevada, and only 36 degrees at San Francisco, California, at Muffet Naval Air Station. Well, in Kansas and Oklahoma yesterday, some strong thunderstorms developed. Some of these dumped up to five inches of rain over parts of northeastern Oklahoma and southeastern Kansas, and flash flood washes were necessary yesterday in several places. Well, except for some snow in parts of northern New England, the weather was quite a contrast in the eastern part of the country. Record high temperatures were broken yesterday afternoon, and early this morning, some dense fog has formed once again in the South Atlantic part coast and the central Gulf states. Now, among the high temperature records broken yesterday afternoon were Washington, D.C., where it got up to 77 degrees, Richmond, Virginia was 80 degrees, and Wilmington, North Carolina had a high yesterday afternoon of 81 degrees. Well, that wraps up Friday morning's national map, and Carl, among other things on satellite, will get a good look at that winter storm. That's right. Still dumping snow over the Rockies and out into the high plains, but every once in a while, it's a real good idea just to take a step or two back and take a look at the entire weather over the Western Hemisphere. Well, we'll do that this morning with our full disk image, and this picture was taken as of 11.30 last evening, Eastern Standard Time. We see off the west coast of the United States, the band of clouds. This is with that new storm that will bring snow in the Cascades. A couple of storms north of the Hawaiian Islands, and across the continent, just to the northeast of Puerto Rico, a new low-pressure system will be investigated by some aircraft a little later on this afternoon. Now we'll focus on the eastern part of the United States. This picture was taken as of 4 o'clock this morning, Eastern Standard Time, and rather a messy cloud pattern. Clouds stretch from the Midwest all the way into the southeastern part of the country. 
Rain, however, is falling roughly from Indiana on westward, and that's the axis of the upper level ridge, and uh, the rain is having a hard time making it any farther east than that. Plenty of cold air up over the northeast and eastern sections of Canada, and some pretty good-sized thunderstorms well off the Atlantic coast. Now we'll take a look at our very latest enhanced satellite view. This picture was taken as of 5.30 this morning, Eastern Standard Time. And we do have some lingering thunderstorms back through the central plains, running into northern Texas and the far western part of the Lone Star State. This smudge of clouds is the upper-level storm system, still bringing the snow into Colorado and parts of Nebraska, and patches of high clouds across the Gulf Coast, elsewhere mostly fair skies. A look now at our very latest radar chart will show that it's raining along the northwest coast and already snowing over parts of the Washington Cascades, highest tops over southwestern Oregon around 17,000 feet, and all of this precipitation is moving off toward the east. Moving into the Plain States, a combination of freezing rain, freezing drizzle, and snow is falling there, highest tops over the Nebraska Panhandle around 14,000 feet, and this area of snow is moving off toward the northwest. Showers and thunderstorms from the Midwest and Southern Lakes trailing back into the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Highest tops over eastern sections around 18,000 feet, but those tops grow up as we move southwestward up to 34,000 feet in southern Oklahoma. Now, speaking of Oklahoma, let's take a look at our very latest radar picture from Oklahoma City. And roughly from Tulsa just to the east of Oklahoma City, OKC, down to Fort Sill in Wichita Falls, Texas, Mainly light to moderate showers, where you see the flashing, a few embedded stronger thunderstorms, one just to the south of the Red River over northern sections of Texas. Joan? Well, we've caught up on current weather conditions, so let's move ahead to the forecast segment of our program, starting with the high temperature map for this afternoon. We see that temperatures this afternoon will drop below freezing for northern Maine and parts of the central high plains. But 60s and 70s will be found from the mid-Atlantic region down into Texas, as well as parts of the southwest. Mild 80s in southern Texas, the southeast Atlantic coast, and down into Florida. Now, overnight lows will dip below freezing for most of the northeast, the plain states, and out to the interior northwest, with teens and single digits from the northern plains into the Great Basin. Milder 60s will be found in southern Texas and along most of the Gulf Coast, 60s and 70s for most of Florida. Carl? Time now to take our last look at the weekend weather maps, and we will start things off with the map for this Friday evening. And that will show the center of the chilly high-pressure system just to the north of Lake Ontario. North and northeasterly winds should keep much of this section of the country dry. Quite a different story back through the Midwest. A low-pressure system just to the east of Kansas City will be bringing a good chance of rain to the mid-Mississippi Valley and most of the lower Ohio Valley. Showers and thunderstorms, lower Mississippi Valley down to the Texas Gulf Coast with the cold front. And snow will still be falling over parts of the Central Plains. High pressure from the eastern slopes of the Rockies back through the plateau will keep most, uh, much of that nation, uh, part of the nation dry. Snow still falling from the Washington Cascades and rain along the coast from the Bay Area on northward. Then by Saturday morning, snow over much of central Washington and Oregon, rain down into central California and a large part of the plateau. We'll have a low pressure system over northern Iowa, rain moving now through the central lakes, rain and drizzle from much of the mid-Atlantic region, showers and thunderstorms back through the western Gulf of Mexico. Moving into Sunday morning, we see the low pressure system now moving almost straight northward into central Canada. It'll be a rainy day for much of the east, a little bit of snow falling over sections of New Hampshire and eastern Maine, showers and thunderstorms once again down to the central Gulf Coast. A few isolated rain showers for parts of the northern and central plains, rain falling over the plateau and throughout much of the northwest with snow limited to the northern Rockies. And then finally, by Monday morning, we'll have the frontal system in the east, right along the eastern seaboard. Best chance of rain from the outer banks of North Carolina, northward through the New England states. High pressure building into the southern Appalachians should start to clear out the Ohio Valley and parts of the Gulf Coast. Cold front, rain and rain showers associated with it down in through New Mexico. And a new frontal system in low pressure area once again will bring some snow into parts of the northern Rockies, interior northwest, with rain, light rain, although, across parts of coastal Washington and Oregon. Joan? Piles with all of the bad weather in the center part of the country and the fog in the southeast and Gulf, it's especially important to be sure to pick up your detailed weather briefing before you take off. As always, you can get this at your local weather service office or flight service station. And then once you're airborne, help out your fellow pilots and send them those reports when you have the time. Now, this morning, we have marginal VFR and IFR conditions stretched across most of the eastern half of the country, some scattered areas of low conditions as well throughout the Rockies, the Intermountain region, and some rain along the Pacific Northwest coast. This morning, we can look for some moderate rime icing in the northwest between the freezing level and 15,000 feet, 
more moderate rime icing in the central high plains and central plains between the freezing level and 18,000 feet. Now, we look at the turbulence for this morning. We find two areas, both of them moderate below 12,000 feet, one in the northwest and the other in the northeast behind the cold front. Now, by this evening, we can expect low conditions to continue from the New England coast across the Midwest down into the central and southern plains. Low conditions as well along the eastern Gulf of Mexico and parts of the coast of the Carolinas. Some scattered areas of low conditions as well throughout parts of the interior northwest and the Great Basin. Now, look at the turbulence for this evening. We see moderate up to 14,000 feet for the northwest. Some thunderstorms could produce some moderate to severe turbulence as high as 40,000 feet for the lower Mississippi Valley and down to the Texas Gulf Coast. By tomorrow morning, we still see low conditions continuing for the eastern sections of the Plain States, stretching throughout the Midwest and Ohio Valley down to the southeast Atlantic coast. Low conditions will also continue to cover most of the Gulf region. DFR conditions across the Rockies, but low conditions with that new cold front stretching from the interior northwest out to the coast of California. Look at the turbulence for tomorrow morning, moderate again up to 14,000 feet in the northwest. We can still see some thunderstorms producing bumps as high as 40,000 feet from the Tennessee Valley down to the Gulf of Mexico. Time for winds aloft. Call has been starting at 2,000 feet above ground level. Not much of a circulation associated with the low pressure system over Oklahoma. However, we can clearly see the high pressure system over the northern lakes, the second one back in the southwest. Strong northwesterly winds for eastern New England, 25 to 50 knots, and also 25 to 50 knot winds for the mid-Mississippi Valley. Now up at 10,000 feet, quite unusual wind speeds over central New England, stronger than 50 knots out of the northwest, generally 25 to 50 knot winds through the northeast, parts of the southern plains, and much of the northwest coast, also with southwest winds, 25 to 50 knots. Now up at 18,000 feet, here we see the low pressure system over the central high plains, Strongest winds on the south and east side of this system, generally 50, a little bit stronger, and 50 to 100 knots as well from Lake Huron on eastward. And finally, up at 34,000 feet, we have our strongest winds over northern and central parts of New England and much of New York State. These westerly winds running a little bit more than 100 knots. And the second jet stream we see moving into western Texas and into the Great Lakes state with wind speeds right around 100 knots for the strongest. Coming up next, we have Weather Watch, and for the full story, let's get back over to Jones. We'll start Weather Watch this Friday morning along the New England coast, where gale warnings are up from Eastport, Maine, to Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Winds are northwest from 25 to 40 knots with 2 to 8 foot speed. Now, these warnings include Boston Harbor and Buzzards and Narragansett Bay. Small craft advisories are in effect from Watch Hill, Rhode Island to Virginia Beach, Virginia, including the Long Island Sand, New York, and Baltimore Harbors, the tidal Potomac and the Tuxent River, as well as the Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay. Winds are north to northwest, 215 to 30 knots. Dense fog is prompting travelers' advisories in southeast Georgia, northern Florida, and most of southern Alabama today. These will be in effect until mid-morning. Along the Texas Gulf Coast, small craft advisories are up from Brownsville to Port O'Connor, with lake wind advisories for parts of southwest and south-central Texas. In northeast Texas, there's a flash flood watch in effect today, and there is a slight risk of severe thunderstorms today from northeast Texas into south-central Missouri. Tonight, this risk area extends into southwest Illinois. While the winter storm is moving into the plains and up the Mississippi Valley this morning, winter storm watches are in effect from northwest Wisconsin through Minnesota and Iowa to South Dakota and Nebraska. These will be in effect tonight and Saturday morning. Then travelers' advisories are in effect from Iowa to Wyoming for a combination of snow and freezing rain tonight and tomorrow. In the northwest, travelers' advisories for snow are up for this morning for the Cascades and Olympic Mountains. Now, gale warnings are flying in the Strait of Juan de Fuca for east winds. Small craft advisories are up for Washington's inland waters north of Everett and along the Washington coast. More small craft advisories are also up along the entire Oregon coast and the California coast from Point St. George to Point Arena. That's Weather Watch and our program as well. Have a nice weekend and join us again on Monday. Stay with us. Today's weather outlook for Maryland is coming up next. is made possible by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hilton Hotels, America's business address. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. The AOPA Air Safety Foundation. The National Business Aircraft Association. Phillips Petroleum Company. 
The United States Air...